in fact. And in fact, if you go to 100 users, by that point, it turns out that there are almost 5,000 possible pairs of users who could choose to communicate with one another. And so what this really means for the growth of the internet is that the internet gathers momentum as it goes, which is to say, as the number of users increases, the usefulness of the network increases, and it becomes even more compelling over time for new users to join the network. By the middle of the 1990s, Moore's Law and Metcalfe's Law were working hand in hand, fueling an upward spiral. Faster, cheaper, more powerful PCs were increasingly connected together, making the network exponentially more useful and exponentially more popular. Though the folks on Wall Street didn't have a clue about how all this technology worked, they could see that this internet thing was really taking off turning into a bona fide mass medium, which meant that there was a killing to be made. And when ignorance meets rampant enthusiasm and unbridled greed, well, you know what that means. It means that a fantastic financial bubble is just around the corner. History tells us that every great wave of transformative innovation is accompanied by a financial mania. The most famous example is the railway frenzy that gripped America and Britain in the mid-1800s. Around the same time, there was a riot of speculation around the telegraph. 50 years earlier, there'd been one around canals. And 50 years later, Ford's Model T ushered in an automobile bubble. In every instance, the pattern was the same. A breakthrough technology creates scads of risky startups. Investors get excited and rush in to buy a piece of the future. And then it all ends in tears. Bankruptcies, foreclosures, stock market immolations. Does that sound familiar to you? Of course it does. For it describes exactly what happened in the 1990s with the internet. The cycle began in 1995, when Netscape launched its improbable and wildly successful initial public offering on the stock market. A year later came the IPOs of search engine companies such as Yahoo and Excite. And a year after that, it was time for Jeff Bezos to take the next step in pushing the web boom in the direction of bubblehood. The Amazon IPO took place in May 1997. The company was just two years old, had precious few revenues and no profits. But Bezos was already calling Amazon Earth's biggest bookstore and hyping its potential to the sky. People were poo-pooing it as, wait a minute, it's just a bookstore, it's not profitable, it's going to run out of money and go out of business. And then you had a lot of other people saying, no, it's Dell, it's this tremendous new model and they're going to grow so quickly. And so right from the get-go, it was tremendously controversial. Jeff Bezos made no secret of the fact that he was out to change the rules of business. One time, he and I were discussing the most unconventional and certainly the most controversial aspect of Amazon's approach. The fact that although its revenues kept rising, it kept losing more and more money. Inspiratorially, Bezos leaned across the table and said, almost nobody knows this, but we actually were profitable for a while. But it was just for one quarter, and we don't like admitting it, because it was an accident. Any time that Jeff had the opportunity, he'd lower prices so that there would be more growth. And quite unlike many other business executives who hold their prices to uh, make more in profit. Now, truth be told, Bezos wasn't actually saying that profits didn't matter or that Amazon could go on losing money indefinitely. He was saying that in the formative gold rush land grab moment in the development of the web, profits could and should be sacrificed temporarily in favor of rapid growth. The strategy Bezos boiled down to three simple words. Get big fast. Get big fast was really important for us. It was our critical strategy. And the reason is we knew that we could offer customers a better experience if we had a certain amount of scale. Absolutely essential to getting big fast for Amazon was convincing customers to trust it with some of their most valuable personal information, their credit card numbers. And to understand how Amazon did that, we need to delve in to the age-old science of encryption. Powerful methods of scrambling messages mathematically had been developed long ago and employed most famously during World War II. But it was clear that something much more sophisticated was needed for the new digital age. The old method needed an upgrade because there was a fatal flaw. To explain this flaw, 
Let's use a low-tech analogy using padlocks instead of mathematical encryption. First, imagine two people, and one wants to send a confidential message to the other, just like a customer wanting to send her credit card to Amazon. Person one, the sender, puts her message in a box, locks it, and sends it off. But here's the snag. The sender of the message now also has to somehow let the recipient know the lock's combination, the code to unlock the padlock. This step is fraught with problems. This is when thieves could surreptitiously observe the code, steal it, and open up the box. Of course, if our sender and receiver already know each other, they could arrange to meet in secret before the message is sent and share the code. Unfortunately, of course, this mechanism is not of that much use in the context of online commerce. And the reason is, in online commerce, you want to enable confidential communication between pairs of parties who have no prior relationship. Right? It's simply untenable for Amazon to have gone into a private room with every possible future customer of Amazon. So we needed a different plan. And that plan came from a trio of California-based mathematicians named Whitfield Diffie, Martin Hellman, and Ralph Merkel, who developed something called public key cryptography. Their scheme turned how encryption had been done for centuries on its head. Let's use our low-tech analogy again to explain the essential idea, which is brilliant, but kind of subtle. The sender puts a message in a box like before, but this time, instead of locking it with her own padlock, she asks the person who will receive the message to buy a padlock and send it to her. When the sender gets the padlock, she uses it to lock the box and then sends it. Now, if someone intercepts the box, they can't open it. In fact, even the sender can't open the box once it's locked. The only person who can open it is the intended recipient, the only person who has the code. Thus, presto, you have something close to perfect security. It took several years and some very clever math to create internet-friendly digital versions of the padlocks and boxes used in our analogy. But work it does, and public key cryptography is the linchpin of secure e-commerce. With consumers flocking to Amazon on the basis of their confidence in secure, convenient e-commerce, Bezos had persuaded Wall Street to back his money-losing, get-big-fast strategy. But the internet boom that Amazon was part of still seemed tenuous. It progressed in fits and starts. The street still wasn't sure that the web wasn't just a fad. And companies like eBay did nothing to dispel that uncertainty, with its buyers and sellers trading in obscure collectibles that had been gathering dust in garages and attics around the country. I didn't know when I created eBay that there were all these collectors out there. I mean, I just, I, did, I didn't even know. You know, I'm not a business person. I didn't do the research to, to begin with. Initially, when eBay came out, you have a lot of investment managers would call up and they'd say, well, come on, it's just a tag sale. It's gross, and who wants to pay for these things that you can't see? We were telling the story about uh, people being basically good, people doing business with one another, and it was funny telling the story in New York City. You know, I mean, people were like, really? In the spring of 1998, Pierre and his investors realized they needed an A-list business person at the helm if they were going to get Wall Street to take eBay seriously. They found one in the person of Meg Whitman, a Harvard MBA who'd been a marketer at Walt Disney and a top executive at the toy company Hasbro. So we were really trying to define the company in terms of collectibles because 98% of the items on the site were in fact collectibles. In fact, 8% of the items on the site